Our presentation is on Cornelia Ruland and Shirley Moore's Peaceful End of Life Theory by Michelle Ross and Michelle Takis. We have four objectives and SMART goals. Number one, participants will name the two theorists of the peaceful end of life theory and describe one fact for each by the end of the presentation. Number two, participants will explore three main components of the peaceful end of life theory by the end of the presentation. Number three, participants will list two examples of how the peaceful end of life theory is used in research by the end of the presentation. Number four, Participants will identify four examples of how the peaceful end of life theory is used in practice by the end of the presentation. Cornelia M. Ruland received her doctorate in nursing from Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio in 1998. Prior to that, she had received her MSN in Oslo, Norway. She worked as the director of the Center for Shared Decision-Making and Nursing Research in Oslo, Norway, as well as was an adjunct faculty for the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University in New York. Throughout her career, she was the primary investigator in many research projects. Her professional beliefs and values surrounded shared decision-making and patient-provider partnerships. Shirley M. Moore also received her doctorate in nursing from Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio in 1993. There she was a professor of nursing theory and nursing science. She also was the research and theory development program creator and an annual contributor to the Rosemary Ellis Theory Conference. Her professional beliefs and values were surrounding theory construct and how that was an essential skill for all doctoral students. Her professional influences were Joyce Fitzpatrick, Jean Johnson, and Elizabeth Lenz. They encouraged her to not only teach and study theory, but also how to create and develop it. The peaceful end of life theory is a middle range theory based on Donna Bedian's model of structure as well as the preference theory. Here you can see the Donna Bedian model for quality of care. It has three components, structure, process, and outcome. This helped guide the standard practice for the development of the peaceful end of life theory. Moore and Ruland looked at nurses who had at least five years of clinical experience. The theory is also based in five major concepts, including pain, comfort, dignity, peace, and closeness to others. This theory was created while Ruland was finishing her doctoral program. Moore was a PhD professor at the time teaching nursing theory. The peaceful end of life theory has outcome indicators that are measurable. It may use qualitative or quantitative methods, but there are currently no specific instruments to measure outcomes. It can be noted that this would be useful in future use of theory to study and create instruments for measurements. One example could be that we could study family perception of end of life care or use other existing tools to measure symptoms such as pain. Here I will break down the five major concepts that are central to the peaceful end of life theory. Number one is not being in pain. This should be the central part of everyone's end of life experience. Second, the experience of comfort. This theory uses Kolkaba's definition, relief from discomfort, the state of ease and peaceful contentment, and whatever makes life easy or pleasurable. Third, experience of dignity and respect. Every patient at end of life should be respected as a human being, and that our personal worth and protection from harm at end of life is equally as important. 
Number four is being at peace. Peace can be physical, psychological, and spiritual. And that is something that should be achieved at end of life for all patients. And lastly, closeness to significant others. Having relationships with others that are physical or emotional is key to a peaceful end of life. Concept definitions. The peaceful end of life theory is considered a higher level middle range theory. This is due to the level of abstraction and complexity within the theory. The concepts are clear throughout. Ruland and Moore defined quality of life as a manifestation of satisfaction through empirical assessment of such outcomes as symptom relief and satisfaction with interpersonal relationships. As previously mentioned, they referenced Kolkaba's definition for comfort, and then they created their own definitions for peace, closeness, and personal worth. These concepts vary throughout the theory from concrete, such as pain and comfort, to abstract, such as dignity. Here you can see the peaceful end of life theory broken down into the five components. Not being in pain includes monitoring and administering pain relief through pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. The experience of comfort, preventing monitoring and relieving discomfort, facilitating rest, relaxation, and contentment, as well as preventing complications. The experience of dignity and respect, which includes patient and significant others and decision making, treating the patient with dignity, empathy, and respect, as well as being attentive to their needs. Being at peace, which is providing that emotional support, the monitoring of the patient's needs for medications, inspiring trust, providing guidance, and providing physical assistance. And then lastly, the closeness to significant others and persons who care. So helping to facilitate that participation of others in the patient's care, attending to others' grief, worries, and questions, and facilitating opportunities for family closeness. Overall, the theory is used in research to help facilitate research questions determine what data is selected and how to interpret the results, and it can offer explanations on phenomena as observed in research. Using the peaceful end of life theory in research can guide research to find weaknesses and strengths in the theory itself. This is done to validate what guides practice and find areas that need improvement. It also provides real-time data of nursing practice as related to end of life care. This helps validate standards and practice and how it impacts care to dying patients. We can use the results of research to inform best practice for creating peaceful deaths. The results can propel practice guidelines as there is currently a lack of these in present practice. This theory can be tested in research to determine usefulness to practice. The research results can determine if the theory is helpful to provide a peaceful death in real settings. The research results can discover appropriate nursing interventions for a peaceful death. The research can show specific statistics on which nursing interventions were most helpful. The research can investigate what patients and nurses determine as a peaceful death. The research can attempt to bring a definition to what a peaceful death is. The following are two examples of how the peaceful end of life theory is used in research. There was a qualitative study that was done in which a new instrument was created based on this theory in order to assess nursing practice at end of life. The instrument is called Nurses Practice of Peaceful End of Life Care Instrument. The results showed that the attitudes of nurses positively correlated with their level of care at end of life. This provides a theoretical framework and practice guidelines. In order to improve peaceful dying, it is necessary to improve beliefs and attitudes of nurses caring for dying patients. The recommendations are to develop more programs based on this theory. 
The second example is a qualitative study that was done in an ICU in Thailand. Nurses were interviewed in order to learn processes that the nurses use to promote peaceful deaths. The results will advance policy change in nursing care processes. Further research is needed to understand practices and processes, and the specific findings were a three-dimensional nursing practice, which is shown on the next slide. Theory shows that promoting peaceful deaths in ICUs includes many factors. The context and conditions in which the nurse works is very important. This includes the social cultural environment and the hospital's policies and procedures. It also includes the type of patients that the nurse is responsible for, the beliefs of the patient, the nurse, and the family, the education, knowledge, and experience of the nurse, and also the gender of the patient and nurse is important. Research showed three dimensions in caring for patients at the end of life. The first one is awareness of dying. This includes monitoring the dying process and appreciating the impending death. This includes knowing signs of end of life and being comfortable with the acceptance of death and no longer trying to cure the patient. The second one is creating a caring environment. This includes mutually accepting death, managing care, and promoting comfort. ICUs are loud, busy, and noisy, and providing a calm, peaceful atmosphere is a challenge, but it is a priority. The third one is promoting end-of-life care. This means preparing patient and family for death and caring for them after the death, which is just as important in continuing a peaceful end-of-life care. Patients and families' main goal at end of life is to be comfortable and free from pain. The peaceful end of life theory is used in practice by promoting being free from pain, being comfortable, and offering dignity and respect. Being free from pain means using pharmaceuticals such as morphine, fentanyl, and Dilaudid. Also using non-pharmaceuticals such as repositioning and allow the patient to express their fear of dying and other painful emotions to be free from pain. Being comfortable means using pharmaceuticals such as lorazepam for anxiety and restlessness, and repositioning with pillows and using massage therapy. Also, bringing in personal items that mean something to the patient and the family can bring comfort. Offering dignity and respect means including the patient and family in decision-making Continue to talk and explain things to the patient, even if they are unresponsive, because they can hear what you are saying. Try to fulfill the end of life wishes as much as possible. And another way to show respect for veterans is to perform an honor walk. We continue to use the peaceful end of life theory in practice by bringing peace to the patient and promoting closeness of family and friends. To bring peace to the patient, we can play music, use essential oils, pray, and promote relaxation. We can provide care according to what is meaningful to the patient. We can discuss their life review, feelings of death, and we can encourage memories of joy and happiness that would bring peace. We can offer to take the patient's handprint at end of life, and that can be very meaningful and peaceful to the family. Promoting closeness to family and friends means allowing the family and friends to stay with no restrictions. We can provide emotional support, build trust, and answer questions and share stories amongst the family members. We can also have discussions for unfinished business and support their grieving process with the use of chaplains and social workers.
There are two examples in how the peaceful end of life theory is used in research. The first one is the cultural awareness of death. This theory brings forth awareness of what peaceful death is and what it means to different cultures and religions. Also, it brings forth what peaceful death is to each and every person. A qualitative study was done in Thailand. It is very important for the people of Thailand to have a peaceful death. Buddhism is the main spiritual belief in Thailand, and monks often provide advocacy for peaceful death. There is a strong belief to let the patient go instead of maintaining them on life support. This theory helps nurses know how to offer peaceful death as dictated by this religion. The second example is decreasing or eliminating nutrition and hydration at the end of life. At the end of life, providing nutrition is not a general practice because it can cause further discomfort as the body is shutting down and does not require any nutrition. This theory helps support withholding food based on promotion of providing peace rather than sustaining life. A qualitative study was done in which the parents withheld artificial nutrition at the child's end of life. The results were that the parents were content with their decision because of the poor quality of life that the child had and the feeding intolerance of the child. All the parents reported that the child's death was peaceful and comfortable. This is a good example in how this theory is used for children as well as adults.